Thank you very much for your gracious introduction. I am very impressed by this program. I want that video. I want to adopt it for our Plowshares Fund board. <laughs> And I'm very pleased that John Hoyt, the president of uh, Pyramid Communications, can join us here today. We have several board members in the Seattle area, so I'm pleased to say I'm a, I come here at least two or three times a year, and it's always a pleasure. And currently, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to get out of Washington, D.C. <laughs> I no longer greet my friends with, how are you? There is no real good answer to that. Uh, Plowshares Fund is a 35-year-old nonprofit public foundation. We raise money from generous contributors, and then we grant it to people who are working on reducing nuclear threats. Um, we're pleased that over the past 35 years, we think our programs have had an effect. There are, in fact, many fewer nuclear weapons in the world. There are fewer countries trying to get them. We've had some very notable successes. And we are now up for a new challenge as a new president comes into office with a new nuclear policy yet to be determined. If you voted against Mr. Trump, you are still in a deep uh, grieving mode. If you voted for Mr. Trump, you are now in a heightened sense of expectation. You voted for big change, and every indication is that you are going to get big change. We don't yet know what exactly that change is. There are many more unknowns in this equation than there are knowns. So we can't predict what is about to happen. And after this last election, I am completely out of the prediction process. I don't know who's going to win the NFC West. I don't know who's going to the World Series. And I certainly did not know who was going to be the President of the United States. But we can isolate some of the variables. We can narrow the range of the possible and discuss some of the possibilities and at least get a preview of what might be to come. And that will better inform us in how we communicate with our public officials, how we communicate with our friends and neighbors as we discuss some of these urgent national security issues. So here are the three risks and three opportunities that I think might appear in the Trump administration. The first risk is one that was highlighted dramatically during the campaign. One of the biggest issues, surprisingly, in the campaign was not the ideology of Mr. Trump, not his policy views, but his temperament. Did you want a, an individual, some would say an unstable individual, who could be baited with a tweet to have control of the country's nuclear weapons? And in the course of this discussion, many Americans learned, some for the first time, that the president has sole authority to launch nuclear weapons. So on January 20th, when Mr. Trump swears his oath of office and leaves the inaugural stand, the military officer that has been following President Obama around for the last eight years, a few, always a few feet from him in every meeting, the man who walks into the elevator with the president so he won't be separated, the man who carries the briefcase with the controls and commands for launching America's nuclear forces will now follow Donald J. Trump. Will Donald J. Trump exercise that authority responsibly? Will he be prone to use a nuclear weapon, either one or a thousand? It is his decision and his decision alone. Once the president decides to launch nuclear weapons and he executes that order, the missiles are launched within four minutes. There is no review, there is no Supreme Court appeal, there is no vote of Congress, there is no cabinet meeting. It is solely the responsibility of the President of the United States. Many people are now questioning why we have that system still. This is a Cold War relic. What reason is there to have our weapons on this hair trigger alert? What reason is there to vest this most profound decision in one person? That's the first risk. The second risk is that the President of the United States might encourage other nations to get nuclear weapons. He, during the campaign, Mr. Trump s said that it might be a good idea for Japan or South Korea or Saudi Arabia to get nuclear weapons. Let's be clear, no President of the United States, Republican or Democrat, liberal or conservative, has ever encouraged another nation to get nuclear weapons, not even our closest allies. We did not want the UK to get nuclear weapons in 1950. We didn't want France to get nuclear weapons in 1960. We didn't want Israel to get nuclear weapons in 1968. 
So if Mr. Trump is serious about this view, which is held by some experts, it's a minority view, but there is a view out there that nuclear weapons are stabilizing, that more countries with nuclear weapons would be good for strategic stability. If Mr. Trump implements that view, we, we could be in uncharted territory. Japan, for example, is in a delicate situation with their economy, with their politics. South Korea is in crisis right now. Their president is about to resign. There are nationalist far-right forces in South Korea and Japan who are now arguing that these countries should have nuclear weapons. A mistake or an intentional statement by the President of the United States could encourage those forces and could tip those countries towards nuclear. Japan could make a nuclear weapon in about three months. It already has a stockpile of plutonium it could use for those weapons. South Korea, very advanced industrial country, would take a little longer, but it wouldn't be far behind. The third risk is that the President of the United States will, as he promised, dismantle the Iran nuclear agreement or renegotiate it or enforce it. He has said all three of those things. It's unclear which one he really means. If the President of the United States decides to follow the advice of some in his party and impose new sanctions on Iran for uh, their nuclear program that remains, uh, if he actually just withdraws from the deal, this will throw the region and our international relations into a profound crisis. John Brennan, the head of the CIA, just said yesterday it would be the height of folly to dismantle this deal. What would happen is that this, as the United States would then impose new sanctions on Iran, but nobody else would. This is a multilateral agreement. There were, the reason the sanctions worked is not because we put them on, it's because so many other countries joined us in fencing in Iran, pressuring them, to come back, come to the negotiating table and negotiate a deal that would start to dismantle its program. Iran did that. We have a deal. They have ripped out two-thirds of their centrifuges, taken the core of their plutonium production reactor, drilled it full of holes, filled it full of concrete, shipped out of the country almost all the uranium gas they had been stockpiling, whereas they had been weeks away from being able to make the material for a nuclear weapon. But as a result of this deal, they were at least a year away. And if they should try to cheat on this agreement, we would detect them because we put in place the most intrusive inspection regime ever negotiated. If we tear up that deal, our allies will not follow us. They have told us over and over again, if the U.S. walks away, we walk away alone. The sanctions regime would crumble, the constraints on Iran's nuclear program would end, and we'd have the worst of all possible worlds. This is why CIA Director John Brennan is saying this would lead us on a path to war. Iran could race off on its nuclear program and we would have, have no diplomatic or economic way to stop them short of military action. Since this is the season of hope, here are the three opportunities that could happen. And I, I mean it, I, we are not sure which path is going, is, the President is going to follow. But he could pursue what he said was his top objective. There was one constant in Mr. Trump's foreign policy views, and that was his desire to improve relations with Russia. Wouldn't it be better, he said, if Russia could have a friendly relationship with the United States? Wouldn't that be better than the way it is now? And he repeated that theme over and over again, never wavering from it. If President Trump can come to a new accommodation with President Vladimir Putin. It would certainly be a very complex negotiation, a very complex relationship, but they clearly have um, a bit of a bromance going on right now. They do have shared business interests. It's possible that those could work in our favor in forming a new relationship with Russia. That would almost certainly include nuclear weapons. And if it did include those nuclear weapons, we could see dramatic reductions in the U.S. and Russian stockpiles. There are about 15,000 nuclear weapons in the world. 95% of them are owned by the United States and Russia. We're the big boys. Everybody else is dwarfed by our nuclear arsenals. You, here in Washington, have about 1,300 of them, located uh, about a half an hour's drive from Seattle at Kitsap Naval, Air, uh, Naval Base. If the President would decide to launch some of those nuclear weapons, a good 300 of them would be launched from 
the subspace to Kitsap. In fact, if Washington State were to leave the Union for any reason, you would become the third largest nuclear power in the world. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a lot of weapons here. You don't really see them very often, but they're here. Um, it could be that the Rep a Republican president could do what other Republican presidents have done. In fact, Republicans are excellent at arms control. Only Republican presidents have made deep reductions to the nuclear arsenal. Ronald Reagan cut the nuclear arsenals of both the U.S. and Russia in half. H.W. Bush cut it in half again. W. Bush cut it in half again. Clinton and Obama trimmed it at the margins. And the reason is political. A Republican president has the political space to do this. He has the trust to do this. He takes at least half of the Republican Party with him and the Democrats support. You have an overwhelming majority of the country in favor of an arms control agreement. If a president who's Democratic makes the same deal, he's attacked by the Republicans for, for selling out the United States for appeasement. It's a traditional route. Democrats always attack Republicans for wanting to dismantle Social Security. Republicans always attack Democrats for, for sacrificing the national security of the United States. You know how this game plays out. It's just it's a tremendous barrier uh, to a Democratic president trying to do the right thing. In fact, I believe if, uh, on the Iran deal, if, if a Republican president had negotiated it, we'd already have named an airport after him. This was, the deal was solid. It was the politics that complicated the matter. So it could be that, that Donald Trump could substantially reduce nuclear tensions in the world by forging this new relationship with Moscow. It's also possible that he could solve the North Korean problem. This is an extremely pressing proliferation danger. It is, in fact, the last great proliferation danger. If you believe, as I do, that the Iran deal stopped the Iranian program in its tracks, has given us at least 15 years of breathing space, then the last remaining country that's building nuclear weapons out there outside the international controls is North Korea and they are accelerating their missile and bomb program. I believe if we don't solve this issue in the next three years, it may become unsolvable. It may be impossible to reverse. Donald Trump has said he will talk to Kim Jong-un. President Obama's policy has completely failed on this. He did not talk to Kim Jong-un. And as a result, the program grew and grew and grew under his eight years. Donald Trump could, could correct those mistakes. Donald Trump might be able to give Kim Jong-un what he wants, a national, uh, an international stage, status, appeal, in exchange for freezing that program and potentially then working to roll it back, a step at a time. There is a growing consensus among experts who study North Korea, Republicans and Democrats, that a deal is possible. I just got a memo from one of our grantees who came back from a, what we call a track two session with North Koreans, where privately Americans are meeting with North Koreans trying to see what the framework of a deal could be. Is it possible? Un unknown, but we'll find out. And finally, Donald Trump could embrace the Iran deal, could decide he's not gonna repeal it, that while we will push back on many actions that Iran does that we disagree with, including their human rights, including their aid for terrorist organizations, including their involvement in the civil wars and conflicts in the region, that the deal is in the national security interests of the United States, whatever else Iran does, at least they're not doing it with the threat of a bomb. And he can take the advice of Stephen Hadley, a man he said to be considering for a senior post in his administration, Stephen Hadley, the former national security advisor for George W. Bush, who just today said that there is a growing consensus that the Iran deal is a good deal and should be kept. Bob Corker, the Senate leader, Republican leader of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a fierce opponent of the deal, said last week we should keep this deal. Chuck Schumer, a Democratic senator who opposed the deal, said last week we should keep the deal. The former Saudi ambassador to the United States, Turkey al Fasl, said last week we should keep the deal. And the reason is simple. Now that the politics are over, people recognize that this actually does contain Iran's nuclear program, rolls it back substantially, reduces a major risk to the United States national security. I don't know which of these things is gonna happen. I think it's, it might be likely that he will do the Iran deal. I think it's almost certain he's gonna try to improve relations with Moscow, but we'll have to see how all this plays out. A great deal depends on what the American people think, and that's why I'm here talking to you today. You have some extremely important influential political figures 
in Washington State, two leading senators. Mr. Adam Smith is the Demo ranking Democrat on the House Armed Services Committee. He knows these issues well. They need to hear from you what you want, what you think. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, whether you're grieving or celebrating, you have to let these political figures know what you want them to tell the President of the United States, what kind of policies you want them to embrace. I thank you very much for giving me a few minutes to talk about these issues, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes. You pick. Jim. Thank you very much for your remarks. I'd be interested if you could uh, give maybe a minute or two the discussion of the efforts uh, apparently in both Russia and the United States to modernize their nuclear arsenals. Yes. Both the United States and Russia are in the same position. The weapons we built during the Cold War, many of which were built by Ronald Reagan and Leonid Brezhnev, are now aging out. They're reaching the end of their operational life. So both countries are replacing them. It's not so much that they're adding. The treaties have limited nuclear weapons, even cut them. So they're not growing, but they're being replaced. Russia's age out first. They're, we have better weapons, frankly. Sound like Donald Trump. Our weapons are better. <laughs> we have the best weapons in the world. Uh, we, 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 and so Russia's ahead. Russia's already building a new ICBM. We have in track programs to develop a new submarine, a new bomber, a new cruise missile for that bomber, and new ICBMs. There's about a billion dollars in the budget now for development of the new bomber, about a billion for the new sub. All told, the plans we have in the books would cost $1 trillion over the next 25 years for new nuclear weapons, replacing the Cold War arsenal that now exists with new, a new version, locking us into this arms race, which former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry calls a new nuclear arms race for the next 30 years. That's why so much depends on what Trump does, because the next two or three years will determine this. If once you start approving those programs, once you start bending metal, it is extremely difficult to stop a program, no matter how much you no longer need it. So a lot, a lot to, depends on this. I think everybody agrees that we have to keep the subs, for example. I think Kitsap Base is going to be around for a long time. But you need all the subs? There are currently eight there. Could you do it four? Every billion dollars you save on nuclear weapons is a billion dollars you can devote to the conventional military to fight the fights we really need to do to address the threats that really exist in the world. Uh, we firmly believe you can reduce the nuclear arsenal, reduce that, reduce those weapons. But that's the situation as it now stands. I'll try to keep my answer short so we can get more over questions. Here. Go. Yeah, thank you for your time. The one country that I didn't hear you mention which causes a little distress is Pakistan. How yeah. do you feel about their arsenal? Um, I wrote a book called Nuclear Nightmares. It's a romance novel. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the chapters in it is the most dangerous country on earth, and it's about Pakistan. It's not North Korea, it's not Iran. It's where this convo, this, where these risk factors just pile up on top of one another. A, 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 a deteriorating economy, an unstable government, strong Islamic fundamentalist forces influencing their military and intelligence, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and Al-Qaeda and ISIS-like groups operating within the national territory of Pakistan, an ongoing conflict with their nuclear-armed neighbor, India, which is getting hotter by the day. Dozens of Indian and Pakistan soldiers have been killed in recent weeks in clashes between the two between the two countries. Oh, and a machinery that they uh, built to first steal nuclear technology so they could secretly build their bomb and then put, used it in reverse to spread this nuclear to uh, technology to Pakistan, to uh, Iran rather, a little to North Korea, to uh, Syria, and, a, and one other country that the IAEA doesn't name, but I think it's Saudi Arabia. So you have a lot of threats there in, in that region and it's, most experts think that if we're to see a nuclear weapon used in combat again, it'll happen in South Asia. And once you use one, you're off to the races. And here's the really bad news. Experts now estimate, using scientific models they've used to study the climate, that if 100 nuclear weapons are used in a nuclear war in that subcontinent, which would kill hundreds of millions of people, it wouldn't be confined to the subcontinent of Asia. 
they would put enough soot and particulates into the atmosphere that it would cover the Earth in a cloud for two or three years, lowering global temperatures about two or three degrees, not much, but enough to kill most major food crops in the world, leading to a famine that would kill a billion people by some estimates. That is a recipe for global chaos. It's a Mad Max type scenario. So you want to, you, what happens far away on the other side of the globe uh, would not stay far away at one side of the globe. It's in all our interest to try to do something to reduce those conflicts, to convince India and Pakistan to stop their arms race and eventually roll back their programs. Okay, John? Yeah, this is kind of tangential part follow-up to that question. Um, I think for many people, a real nightmare scenario is, <clears throat> as you mentioned, a terrorist group getting mm. possession of a weapon and boom, New York City goes up. Boom, yeah. Washington DC goes up. Boom, Seattle, you know. Uh, to what degree are you sanguine about the oversight intelligence, uh, you know, we have 17 intelligence committees, I think, in Congress and different groups. Are you comfortable with the oversight of that scenario, uh, you know, a, a terrorist group getting a weapon? Just, just one. This is the number one threat listed for years in the national security strategy of the United States, whether it was Bush or Obama's. The, the risk of a terrorist attack uh, on the United States. It's a low probability event. It is hard to do, but it has enormous consequences. Not just the hundreds of thousands of lives that would be lost, but the political impact. You think you like the Bill of Rights? After a terrorist attack in the United States like that, you could take, take that Bill of Rights and put it up on the shelf and you might never see it again. Because the people would be demanding search and seizure like we never saw before to prevent it from happening again. You like your stock portfolio, kiss it goodbye. Market, markets would plummet as everybody stopped international transportation to search and make sure there wasn't another nuclear bomb being smuggled in. So how do you stop that? A well-funded terrorist group like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda, could build a crude Hiroshima-type bomb, but they can't make the stuff, the highly enriched uranium and plutonium that goes in it. That requires a huge industrial f facility. But if they can steal it or get it from Pakistan, from some of the warehouses in the states of the former Soviet Union, then they could build that device. One of the great successes of Obama's nuclear policy, which failed in many respects, is his, the way he brought together the leading nations of the world to, to secure these materials more thoroughly. Some had been guarded just as if they were library books. And people had civilian uses for highly enriched uranium, which was leaving them in, in padlocked warehouses. Well, he led the effort to, get, to tighten up controls and in some cases eliminate that nuclear material entirely. So one example, Ukraine. Ukraine used to have enough highly enriched uranium for many bombs. However tragic the situation is in Ukraine right now, it does not involve highly enriched uranium. It does not involve a nuclear terrorist risk. We have to keep those programs going. We're about halfway there in securing these materials. We've got to finish the job. Thank you, Joe. We have one last question here. Thank you for your comments today. They're very enlightening. You asked us to let our uh, representatives know, how do we do that best? Aside from taking to Twitter, which we've heard so much about, and particularly for the younger constituents who really want to let it known, there's been different things. There's been protests, there's been different actions. Oh. How do you say we should let Adam Smith and the others know? So I worked on congressional staff for um, almost 10 years. And believe me, if it's one letter, Okay, not so much, but you start getting even a dozen letters or emails now on a subject, people start paying attention. And whether, they're, whether you're for their policies or against them, they pay attention both ways. They want to know that there's political support for them doing the right thing. So if you agree with Adam Smith, if you agree that we can safely reduce the amount of money we're spending on nuclear weapons, he said just last, uh, a few months ago, the day of reckoning is coming. Everybody knows we can't afford all the nuclear programs that we have on order. Something's got to give. Do we really need enough nuclear force, he said, to destroy the world six, seven times over? If you agree with Adam Smith, go let him know. Write him a letter. Go to one of his town hall meetings, um, an email. 
to his office, a phone call to his office. People keep track of these things. People are very sensitive. Every single member of Congress is deeply, uh, Congress is deeply insecure about their position. And if they were secure before this November election, they are not secure now. <laughs> So let them know, Maria Cantwell, Patty Murray, extremely influential senators in favor of moderating our nuclear programs, not ending them, moderating them, reining them in a little bit. If you like that, go let them know. Sir, it is 126. I am done. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. So I've got a two-part call to action today. Uh, actually, the, the, the call has been issued by others, so I'm just going to put the frosting on that cake. Let's accept the mission possible. Let's accept the Reach One, Each One, Reach One uh, membership initiative this year. There are a lot of resources available to us. Let's share Rotary with the people who we care about and bring them to Rotary. Let them decide for themselves that this is a group of concerned citizens that they want to be a part of. So call to action number one. And call to action number two speaks directly to what Joe was talking about. We can sit and listen to what's going on and read about what's going on in terms of decisions being taken and actions being taken in our name, in our nation's capital. But let's get involved. And so I love the call to action to speak to our representatives. Let them know what we want, what we think on a whole range of issues, but especially on this very compelling topic of nuclear weapons control. So my call to action for this week. Last but not least, we've got a very special program to look forward to next week. The Seattle Symphony is hosting us at Benaroya Hall, and we'll hear from the musical director, Ludo Morlo. He's going to tell us how they make decisions about the program and the artistic content of the symphony. And then Simon Woods, the CEO of the symphony, is also joining us to tell us about the business of being a Seattle orchestra. Uh, and then finally, we'll have a performance. So we'll uh, start lunch about 12. I'll ring the bell at 12.30, and we'll enjoy a lovely program over at Benaroya Hall with the Seattle Symphony. So I hope you'll be able to join us. Thank you, everyone. We're adjourned until then.